Homo sapiens first appeared around 300,000 years ago in East Africa. At the time, we shared the planet with at least four other bipedal ape species, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo floresiensis, and Homo heidelbergensis. All were in existence in various parts of the world during the time in which our species evolved. In this video, we'll talk about what defines us as a separate species from the remainder of these uh, of bipedal ape species, but also our journey to becoming the sole remaining bipedal ape species on the planet and what it means to be human. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. In this video, we're going to talk about what it is to be human. We're going to talk about Homo sapiens. So what sets Homo sapiens apart or defines us as a species? When we look at a species known as Homo sapiens, we're looking at a species that has an enlarged brain case with a round, highly vaulted skull with a nearly vertical forehead with very low, very small, almost invisible brow ridges and no sagittal crest. We're also looking at a species that has shortened arms and lengthened legs. We're also going to be looking at a species that has a narrow bowl-shaped pelvis leading to premature birth and the birth of underdeveloped young. That's the anatomical and physical characteristics that sort of set us apart from the remainder of these species. So the thing that really defines us from all these separate species is our intelligence. As far as we know, Homo sapiens are the most intelligent species to have evolved on the planet Earth. And the reasons for our high levels of intelligence um, are, are still a source of speculation. There are many different reasons why high levels of intelligence may have evolved in human beings. First and foremost has to do with the fact that we give birth to underdeveloped young. This necessitates a good deal of socialization. You may have heard the old, the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child. That's not inaccurate. When you have when you have females of the population that are giving birth to immature young, they're going to be tied up for a significant period of time, helping that child reach sort of maturity. I mean, think of how long it takes before a child can be even mod moderately self-sufficient. It's years, not days or weeks or months like it is with most other species. So if half the population is tasked with sort of caring for that, the other half has to be tasked with sort of defending and hunting and gathering and doing all that sort of stuff. Well, that's really hard to do if you're just a single family unit. It's much easier to do if you belong to a tribe, to a large group of individuals that can sort of help each other out and work together communally. And that's indeed what we see with Homo sapiens. We see them existing in large groups, whereas other species of bipedal apes existed in groups, sometimes in, in measured in tens or maybe 20 to 40. Um, Homo sapiens, well, if you look at modern society, we're finding that billions of us can actually live together in sort of a global community that simply something isn't something that's possible in other species and that necessitates a good deal of intelligence the ability to communicate the ability to interact to navigate social milieus and be able to survive as a part of a society um, is definitely a selection pressure that would have led to the evolution of high levels of intelligence another potential reason for why intelligence may have evolved in human beings has to do with the climate. So we know about 300,000 years ago, there was a huge amount of climate variability, particularly in East Africa. In other words, being able to sort of cope with consistently changing environments to navigate these changes in climate, wet seasons, dry seasons, temperature, that takes a good deal of intelligence in order to survive. And very likely those that were able to better cope um, with and, and sort of adapt to these situations were the ones that were going to survive and reproduce in higher numbers. So indeed, selection pressure towards increasing intelligence would have definitely uh, been in play in terms of that. We also start to see uh, heavy use of tools. So we start to see this in Homo habilis. It gets even more pronounced when we get to Homo erectus and some other species. Homo sapiens were very capable of developing advanced tools, even more so than any other species. So the individuals that were able to make craft better tools, better innovative tools, use them with more efficiency, all of which takes a high level of intelligence, high reasoning, uh, you know, the ability to do a lot of reasoning skills. Uh, all of that is definitely something that is necessary and requires a high level of intelligence to do that. Again, yet another selection pressure in favor of those 
more intelligent individuals that would lead to them reproducing in higher numbers. So again, you see all of those sort of Darwinian characteristics coming into play here, driving large brain sizes, which is likely why our species is probably the most intelligent species to ever exist or have existed on the planet Earth. So Homo sapiens originated in East Africa. That's what all the fossil evidence suggests. But as of the year 2021, when I'm shooting this video, we are the sole remaining bipedal ape species on the planet, and we are likely the most ubiquitous species on the planet Earth. We live everywhere. So at some point, we had to leave Africa. So how and why did this happen? Well, uh, there's a lot of evidence, and some of it is conflicting in terms of when we left Africa. Um, so there is actually strong evidence that Homo sapiens may have left or at least tried to leave Africa as early as 185,000 years ago. We do find some remains in uh, near Asia, so like the Middle East area and even as far in some cases, some evidence possibly as far uh, east as India uh, that Homo sapiens made it that far by about 120,000 years ago. But what we do know is if Homo sapiens did leave Africa, that early, they didn't persist there. So that may have been evidence of sort of a first wave of emigration out of Africa, but not one that persisted with any length of time and didn't give rise to any of the modern day civilizations that we have today. Mitochondrial DNA evidence, which is always passed down through the maternal lineage from mother to offspring, from mother to offspring over and over again, indicates that the, the wave that sort of led to civilization, as we know, or the spread of modern humans occurred about 60,000 years ago. And there's a good deal of fossil evidence showing how that happened. And we see that uh, it, there was likely two different routes that made it out of Africa, sort of a southern route that led to the colonization of the Near East, uh, Asia, and eventually Australia, um, and then eventually into North America around 12 to 14,000 years ago. Uh, there's also another uh, nor a northern route that led uh, into uh, into uh, mi into Eastern Europe and then eventually into Western Europe uh, and spread that way. So there's a good deal of evidence that suggests that. But how did humans get out of Africa? What took us so long and what happened to the other bipedal ape species that had existed at that time? Well, the main barrier to Homo sapiens leaving Africa was likely those other bipedal ape species. Uh, at the time, uh, up to about 100,000 years ago, we have Homo erectus still settled, very well established in, in, in the Near East, uh, you know, what we call it, what's also referred to as Asia Minor. So sort of that land, the Sinai Peninsula, which is that sort of land bridge that connects Africa uh, to Asia and up through Europe. So Homo erectus was there. We also know Europe was being dominated by Homo neanderthalensis at this point. So in other words, it was very likely that the earlier waves of immigration failed simply because early Homo sapiens were not able to outcompete those more established species. So what eventually happened? Well, we know by about 100,000 years ago or so, Homo erectus was gone. We stopped finding fossils of Homo erectus. So what likely happened to them? And we know about 40,000 years ago, Homo neanderthalensis disappeared from its last bastions, uh, which we believe to be sort of uh, near the, the Iberian Peninsula near Spain and Portugal. So what happened? Well, there are two competing theories. Uh, one of them is more likely than not as to what happened to the other species. The first one is known as the interbreeding scenario. This would argue that Homo sapiens quite simply interbred with Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalensis and any other species that went away that still existed at that time. And basically, we just sort of went through a fusion event where these disconnected species were reconnected through a fusion event and united into a single species that we now just simply call Homo sapiens, modern humans. But that's unlikely. Even with Neanderthals, the, 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 the species that we have DNA evidence of, our genome only consists at most of about 3% Neanderthal DNA in some cases. That's not enough. If there were a fusion event between two species, we would expect the genomic contributions to be at least roughly equal or at least more equal than 3% to 97%. So the more likely alternative theory is that we simply outcompeted them. Homo sapiens were likely more intelligent than Homo erectus, than Homo neanderthalensis or any other species that existed. The other thing we seem to have the ability to do is to cooperate in much larger numbers. So earlier on, when smaller bands of Homo sapiens tried to make it out of Africa, they were probably beaten back by the more established species. But as Homo sapiens uh, developed more, developed better tools, better weaponry, and cooperated in higher numbers, we quite, quite simply likely overwhelmed them. 
another piece of evidence suggesting that we simply outcompeted them, which is a polite word for we probably just killed them and just moved over and took the space where they lived, uh, is the fact that wherever Homo sapiens went, all large bodied mammals and birds just sort of disappear within a few hundred years. Uh, we kind of are the great killers of the last half a million years. Uh, wherever we go, things seem to die because we hunt them and we eat them for food. That just seems to be who we are and who we always have been, uh, which is sort of a depressing outlook on who we are as a species. But it's also the one that seems to be supported by almost all of the fossil evidence. So the odds are the reason why, we, why there are no more bipedal ape species on the planet is simply we were able to outcompete them. So what happened, uh, you know, to sort of document this and sort of what happened on our journey as a species? So one of the things we start to see throughout the evolution of Homo sapiens as a species, it, the first major event we see was about 70,000 years ago. So if you remember, the first emigration wave was probably between 150 and 100,000 years ago. It was failed. But around 70,000 years ago, we see something that Yuval Harari has termed uh, the, the cognitive revolution. All of a sudden, about 70,000 years ago, we start to see the appearance of more advanced tools. We start to see things like harpoons. We start to see things like fishing hooks, um, composite tools. Essentially, it looks like around 70,000 years ago, humans uh, learned to do a lot more than we used to be able to do. This has been termed, like I said, the cognitive uh, revolution uh, in Homo sapiens. Then it's not surprising then within 10,000 years or so, we could take these new tools. We could take these new uh, techniques that we've had, this, you know, this, this new intelligence that we're starting to display and sort of utilize that to sort of work together as a group and then start to push our way out of Africa and push our way through those less intelligent uh, bipedal ape species that were existing at the time, the Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, and so on and so forth. The other thing that Harari suggests may have led to the success of Homo sapiens is something that we can do that no other species we know of really seems to be able to do, and that's sort of imagine a future. I know it seems strange to say that, but most other species aren't really able to plan for a future. Homo sapiens are. And how do we know that even early Homo sapiens, you know, 70 to 100,000 years ago, were able to do this? Well, we can look at some of the things that we see. For example, we see as early as 70 to 80,000 years ago, the establishment of trade routes. We start to see evidence of, for example, rocks like obsidian hundreds of miles away from where obsidian can naturally be found. Uh, one of these, th we also see the evolution of sort of things like currency, for example, like shells and things like that, that were utilized in exchange for goods. What does that tell us about humans? What that tells us is even 70 to 100,000 years ago, humans were able to sort of plan and cooperate and establish sort of rules for being able to trade. They were able to go over the horizon. It takes the ability to plan for a future to go from point A to a long distance to point B and know like there's going to be somebody there to know that, you know, I can bring this with me and I'll end up with something. Think about your dog. If you have a dog, your dog is always really excited to see you come home from wherever you've been, even if you've only been gone for like an hour. And that's because for that dog, that hour was eternity. They don't have a concept of, oh, he'll be back in a little bit. They, they don't understand that because they can't really plan for the future like human beings can. The establishment of things like trade routes, of boats that would sail over the horizon, the ability to spread and say, hey, we're just going to go off and there's going to be something there when we get there. That is not something that's easy to grasp for most other species. And our ability to do this as a species was likely something that helped us as we progress as a species to develop as a species. And then we began to spread out of Africa and to overtake some of these other species and sort of establish ourselves in other natural environments. So as I said, Homo sapiens made it out of Africa. The lasting migration started probably around 60 to 65,000 years ago. The northern route led Homo sapiens up through um, up through the Sinai Peninsula into Europe where they would compete with Neanderthals and sort of establish their dominance over that area by about 40,000 years ago. The southern route would have taken them through the Middle East, eventually into Asia, making it across Beringia into North and South America by 15 to 14,000 years ago or so. And at this point, Homo sapiens had essentially spread over all the entire landmass uh, uh, over the planet Earth. So then what happened to us as a species? 
Well, about 12,000 years ago, we see another revolution in humans. This is known as the first agricultural revolution. This was when humans were domesticated by plants. And I didn't say that backwards. What happened about 12,000 years ago, starting 12,000 years ago, but occurring in successive waves over the next several thousand years, is we start to see the cultivation of crops. What this led to, we started to see, for example, humans started to be able to take, and mainly it was grasses, so things like rice, barley, wheat, things like that, uh, millet. We started to see, basically, humans stop doing this hunter-gathering thing that they had done for over 100,000 years and start setting up, basically, agriculture. And doing so allowed them several benefits. So uh, it allowed them to grow larger populations to establish a stable supply of food. They could get rid of this migratory lifestyle and sort of establish themselves. And we tend to think of this agricultural revolution of leading to sort of the modern way of life and that this was like the first step in the improvement of human beings to being modern humans. But one of the questions that I have to ask is, well, was this actually an advancement for humans? Now, I want to be clear about something. It is 100% the case that without this event, society as we know it would never have existed. And the scientific revolution we'll talk about in a little bit and the industrial revolution, none of this would have happened without this agricultural revolution. So I'm not saying that like there weren't benefits to it. But what I'm asking is, was there a better lifestyle for these newly agricultural humans? And it turns out that there were some downfalls to this. So, for example, one of the benefits to having an established food supply is that you have an established food supply and you can now grow larger populations because you can feed them with this relatively stable food supply. The downside is most early agriculture was surrounded uh, based on a few foods that vary from region to region. So all of a sudden we go from having this very highly varied diet that was rich in nutrients and vitamins and minerals and all that sort of stuff to a very narrow diet that was probably too high in carbohydrates and roughage and didn't contain enough of the essential vitamins and minerals. So our diet's actually now crappier. We have more food, it's just not as good for us as it used to be. We're no longer dealing with seasonal fruits and vegetables as we migrate to the environment. It's just wheat and everything's wheat based and some other things that go along with it. The other downside to this is that as we start to develop these larger populations, we sort of walked into an irreversible trap because once we established this agricultural lifestyle, there really was no way back out of it because this large food supply was required to maintain this large population. We couldn't revert back into this sort of migratory nomadic lifestyle that we once had without at least losing a significant number of the people that we love and hold dear. So now that we've established this, we can't really go back without lots of people dying. So now agriculture just has to be the way that we exist as a species because without it, in this case now, billions of people are going to die. Now as these populations grew bigger, now we run into other issues because before we had agriculture, things like famine were never a problem. Drought was really never a problem. We were always able to find enough food to maintain our population size by sort of migrating from one environment to the next. Typically, we could find water. We, our ancestors knew where to go to find water, where to go to find the right food. They knew the seasonal changes. We lost that ability as we became agriculturalists. But the other thing we start to see then is we start to see the, uh, the progression uh, or the spreading of uh, communicable diseases. Again, in relatively small bands, diseases really aren't a big problem. However, as we start to set up and we form you know, bigger communities, we start to form eventually towns and cities and things like that. Um, we start to see large amounts of people living in relatively close proximity. And all of a sudden, now we start to sp see the spread of communicable diseases, things like tuberculosis and, and other diseases that lead to death. So in reality, disease and famine are inextricably tied with this new, air quotes, better lifestyle that we see after the agricultural revolution. And back to my earlier statement, I, don't, I would argue, and I think others might argue, that we didn't domesticate plants Plants domesticated us. Because if you think about it, what it means, these plants that, that are now largely the dominant species on the planet, things like wheat and rice and soy and corn, all of these species were relatively minor members of their ecosystems until these weird apes came along and started growing them. Think about what it means to be one of these crop species. They don't have to worry about their own replication because humans spread their seeds for them. 
they don't have to worry about finding water because humans will bring water to them. They don't have to worry about feeding them because humans will till their soil and remove weeds and any other competition. By and large, the agricultural revolution largely benefited these small groups of plants that are now utilized as our crop species because they're now some of the dominant species on the planet, all because they've got this ape that follows them around. A member, not even of their own kingdom, follows them around and makes sure that they grow and reproduce in high numbers over and over again. And to be clear, that work is backbreaking labor. It's not easy. Think about what agriculture would be like without modern farm implements. It was backbreaking labor in the hot sun that didn't always work. And if it didn't work, your family and other families nearby you might die and starve. So was the agricultural revolution a good thing? In some ways, yes. But in other ways, humans kind of walked into this irreversible trap that we can no longer get back out of, at least not without significant damage to the human population as a whole. Now, the other thing that starts to happen as agriculture begins to spread across the world is we start to see the first civilizations. We start to see th places like Babylon. We start to see the ancient Incan civilizations. And where we find the earliest civilizations, we find them in places that had the best places for agriculture. Humans became centered around agriculture. We start to see the first civilizations, the first cities, the first states begin to form because what starts to happen as we start to get this new agricultural lifestyles, we start to see the first appearance of what Yuval Harari would refer to as shared fictions. Shared fictions are these things that only really exist in the human mind, but they're essential for sort of maintaining structure and order in our large populations. There's a very interesting body of research that suggests that anything over about 200 people really requires some sort of rigid structure to maintain order. Humans can know about 200 people and sort of keep them in their memory bank, but over uh, about 200 is just too much. So when we start gathering in larger numbers, we need to have some sort of system. And these systems largely derive on things that, that are often referred to as shared fictions. So for example, as agriculture begins to form on the land, land all of a sudden begins to have value. The more land that you have, the more crops you can grow, the more crops you can grow, the more food you can produce, the bigger your family can be, and the more you can support. But if you have too many crops, then you want to be able to sell them. So we need a shared fiction. We need currency. But we also can't just have anybody taking land from anybody else, so we need to establish another shared fiction. Laws. Laws are just a shared fiction. There's a reason that your cat doesn't feel bad about murdering a bird, because it's not going to go to jail for it. That particular thing is a shared fiction. Human rights are a shared fiction. I'm not saying that human rights aren't important, that they aren't real. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that in terms of the actual physical universe, human rights are a created thing that we've established as a species. Again, I'm not anti-human rights. That's not what I'm saying. But what I want you to understand is this sort of anything that in terms of laws, morality, rights, you know, all of the currency, all of these are shared fiction. Think about what currency looks like. Currency could be shells. Currency could be gold. Currency could be paper money. Those dollar bills that you have in your pocket, if you still have that, are just a shared fiction. It's green paper. And the only reason it has value is because the people you give it to believe it's worth something. If they didn't believe it, I mean, try to try to give your dog money and see what he does. He's not going to do anything because dogs know that it's just a green piece of paper worth nothing. The intrinsic value of currency is that people believe in it. Think about what currency is in 2021. It's basically a bunch of digits in your bank account. That's all it is. You give people a little plastic card and they take some of those numbers away from your one account and put it, and now they have more numbers in their account. That's all currency is. It's just a shared fiction. We start to see uh, all starts of these shared fictions begin to pop up in human civilizations. For example, we start to see that human lives become dependent on growing seasons, which we know change. Good weather, dry, dry summers, uh, too much rain floods the crops, we get drought, we get famine, we get disease. What do early humans begin to sort of attribute these things to? They attribute to them to deities. We start to see the first real belief in deities just following the agricultural revolution. Why? Because humans are seeking to sort of understand their world. And the, the only thing they can think of is that there are these higher power beings out there that sort of control this. Again, another shared fiction. I'm not talking about anybody's religion in particular. Uh, but you know, it's just these are these are all these shared fictions that start to appear that dictate our society. We're surrounded by shared fictions. Our civilizations really are these shared constructs that we come about. But that is one of the great things about being a human. Human beings, our great gift as a species has always been able to cooperate. That's what got us out of Africa in the first place. That's allowed us to get, anytime we've done anything major as a species, it's been 
due to our ability to cooperate in believing these shared fictions together to structure our societies, to structure our world. So shared fictions are essential for humanists. They are one of the things that makes us human. About 500 years ago, we see another, another revolution. We find the scientific revolution. People started looking for things other than supernatural explanations to explain the world around them. We see Sir Francis Bacon and other members of, of sort of his class start to decide we need to come up with a way of explaining natural phenomena through natural means. It's not right to just simply say because this, because that, and using supernatural explanations to describe the world around us. It establishes the scientific method. And over the last 500 years, we have seen the greatest advancement of any species ever on the planet Earth. Think about where we come. 500 years ago, we're in the Dark Ages. We're in the 1500s. We're talking Magna Carta and kings and, 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 and feudalism and, and, and people like burning witches at stakes and so on and so forth. In 2021, we're sending rockets into space on a daily basis. We've been to the moon. We're exploring the depth of the universe. We can cure diseases and we can prevent other diseases and all these different things. This is amazing, the ground that we've covered in 500 years, and it's all the result of this particular scientific revolution as we began to search for the natural explanations for the way the world existed around this. 200 years ago, the scientific revolution leads to another major revolution, the Industrial Revolution. We start to see the we start to see relatively small cities turn into giant cities overnight. We see the human population boom as there's another agricultural revolution brought on by the industrial revolution, because new farm implements can be produced in mass in these new factories that allow for greater crop production. Science gives us a better understanding of how to produce crops in higher abundance and how to make crops more nutritional and, and, and better so we can grow bigger population sizes. But the other thing to realize is this industrial revolution was being powered. It was being powered by, by rocks found in the earth. It was being f powered by the rocks formed by the carboniferous forests and by the petroleum produced when the dinosaurs died in the Cretaceous. All of this carbon was, was sequestered deep within the earth in the form of either petroleum oil or in the form of coal. But now it's being reintroduced into the atmosphere because the Industrial Revolution was powered by burning these fossil fuels, which reintroduced this carbon, which had been sequestered deep within the earth for literally hundreds of millions of years, and it's now being put into the atmosphere. And as a result, we're starting to see an accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And here's the thing to realize. We've talked about it all along. What happens when there's a huge amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? global temperature rises. It's impossible for it not to happen. We've seen it time and time again from way back in the in, in the Cretaceous period all the way up, or way back in the, in the Cambrian period, all the way up through the modern times. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going up. It's the result of burning these fossil fuels that were trapped within the earth for hundreds of millions of years. It's there now. It's going to happen. What's going to happen? The polar ice caps are going to melt. And we're going to end up with all those warm shallow seas like we saw back in the Triassic and the Jurassic. And, and here's the thing. Life on the planet Earth is going to flourish. We just might not be here to see it. So the thing we have to realize is this. Human beings appeared about 300,000 years ago. We kind of grew up as this weird tertiary species on the savannas of Africa. Yeah, we could hunt and yeah, we could do things, but we still had to sort of bow to the great predators like the lions and and the leopards and the species like that, that were really the apex predators out there. But through our brains, through our cooperation, through our ingenuity, we found ways to make a living as a species and to expand to become the most intelligent, powerful species that this planet has ever seen. There has never been a species like us ever before. No species on the planet Earth has ever had the power that we have had. But we didn't get this kind of power the way most species reached the apex level of their ecosystem. Most species require hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Look at sharks. Sharks have been around for like, three or 400 million years. It's really only been in the last like 60 million years that they're like this great terrifying thing in the ocean. Remember way back in like the Triassic, the Jurassic Cretaceous, they were getting eaten by things like, like Mosasaurs and Plesiosaurs and all those. They reached their apex level through hundreds of millions of years of evolutionary shaping. We went from this minority species on in the, in the, the savanna of Africa to being the most dominant species in the history of the world in like 100,000 years. And we did it with our brains. Now, I'm not saying that human beings didn't evolve. Yes, we evolved like every other species, but our evolution led us to have this amazing problem-solving brain that's capable of rational thought, of future planning. And it's led us to, to be this awesome thing that we are. But as is said in Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. 
because we are the most powerful species this earth has, have, uh, has ever seen, because we have the ability to, to shape what happens with this planet, it is our responsibility as a species to ensure that we don't do anything to harm the planet. And that's kind of where we're at. We're at a very crucial point in the existence of our species right now. We are in a unique position. We are the only species, the only species that knows where it came from, that knows its evolutionary path, that understands how we came to be where we are and what we are and who we are and where we are. We know all of those things. We are the only species to ever have the power to destroy the planet Earth. We are the only species that may knowingly cause our own extinction. The final thing I want to think about is if you looked at a species, if I told you there was a species on the planet, that if you go back a few hundred thousand years, there were half a dozen to a dozen different members of that particular group of species on the planet Earth, and now you're down to a single species, would you be worried? I would be. If there, were a, if there were dozens of different species of cat running around and all of a sudden there was one species left, you'd be like, man, that's it. That species is in rough shape. That's who we are now. For the first time since the first human ancestor evolved on the planet Earth about 8 to 9 million years ago, there is a single species of bipedal ape on the planet Earth. Us. We're the last ones. So the question we have to ask ourselves now is what are we going to do? We have all of this power. We have, we have this important role on the planet earth what are we going to do about it that's a question that you have to answer that we have to answer together as a species thanks for tuning in i hope you learned a lot i'll talk to you soon